say good morning. So good morning, everyone, and welcome to the JW3 Friday Briefing. I'm Judy Trotter, Head of Adult Education, and a special wel welcome this morning to our guest, Rabbi Gideon Sylvester. So for the past 10 months, 10 months since uh, 7th of October, we provided opportunities for us at JW3 to connect. We've had panels, lectures, guests flying in from Israel, get-togethers and projects. Uh, the Love Lock is still going on with the padlocks on the bridge. Uh, we're uh, doing all sorts of things that you've all come to and been connected with. And of course, we've had this Friday briefing, which allows us to connect directly with Israel. Our range of guests has been wide, and today I'm so pleased that we're joined by Rabbi Gideon Sylvester. Gideon and I go back a long way. I think we first met at Limerd in very early days. And after his training, he, he uh, served for many years as a rabbi of Radlett. He made Aliyah, and he's now the British United Synagogue's Israel rabbi. It's very um, outstanding <laughs> title and quite a responsibility. He also teaches the Jewish approach to human rights to Israeli students and uh, American uh, rabbinical students. So, of course, this has been a hugely touch, a tough period, including this week. And so our sincere thanks for joining us, Gideon. Um, as always, please put your questions in the chat so that I can put them in. Or we might change that and say, actually, you can speak. We'll see how the timing goes. Gideon, over to you. And thank you so much. Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you so much for inviting me. It's a great honor to be here um, as part of JW3's program. Uh, it's lovely to reconnect with Judy, who's a very old friend. Um, and it's very lovely that you're all taking this close interest in what's going on in Israel. Um, at the same, same time, I should mention that we in Israel are also following what goes on in England. And I think we've also all been very disturbed um, by the by the anti by the kind of racist demonstrations that were taking place uh, last week, which I think were pretty frightening uh, to watch, um, and also by some of the anti-Semitism uh, which has come up on the university campuses, uh, which has also been deeply, deeply disturbing because it's not my recollection of how England was. So our hearts are going out to you and we appreciate the way that your hearts are, are coming out to us. Um, and especially because I think it takes an act of enormous courage um, and determination and sometimes even imagination uh, for Jews in Britain to support Israel um, because sometimes the media coverage that you get in England um, is very, very different to the media coverage that we get here. Um, and I think sometimes, uh, well, I remember when I was in Radlett that there were times when it took just immense faith in Israel um, not to believe some of the very nasty things that were being said about Israel um, and to and to open myself to the possibility that things were a bit different. Um, and because I watch Sky News here from Israel, um, it's very clear to me that the reporting that you get is very different to the reporting that we get. Um, and in some senses, we have a lot to learn from what's being said uh, on news media outside Israel and some of the scenes that you get to see of Gaza that, that are not reported here. Um, but on the other hand, I think Israel's the picture of what's going on in Israel and how Israeli feels are feeling about it um, is very different. So what I thought I'd do for the few minutes we have is a little bit autobiographical um, about how the war has 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 um, has hit my life. Um, and then a few words connecting it to Tisha B'Av, because I'm a rabbi and that's what you're supposed to do. And also because it's kind of on my mind. So on October the 7th, I got up early um, and went to shul. Um, and I went to shul with, with my mum, who was staying with me for Shabbat, um, and a guest. Um, and a rumour went round that about 70 people had been killed. Um, but my assumption was rumours always exaggerate, so it couldn't be all that bad. Um, and we started the service. And as we started the service, um, the, the, the air raid sirens went off um, and we all dashed for cover. Um, my mum was in a wheelchair at that time, so I was wheeling her chair under the cover as well. And then we would come out and we would carry on dancing 
Um, and then 10 minutes later or eight minutes later, it happened again and again and again and again. Um, and we realized that, that, that really awful things were going on. Um, but there was a sense of kind of pride. Um, there was a sense that no matter what, we would carry on dancing. We would carry on as Jews. We wouldn't back down in the face of violence. Um, after Yom Tov went out, um, I called my son, Ariel. I didn't quite realize uh, what it meant that he was in Sterot. Um, and he did not answer the phone to me. Instead, he sent me back a WhatsApp saying, Dad, I can't speak. I'm not allowed to use the toilet. I'm not allowed to use switch on the lights um, because there are Hamas terrorists and they're just by my street and I'm getting photographs of them um, down the road. Um, and they've just blown up our local police station. Um, and even then, when he said those words to me, and even for months afterwards, I didn't think I quite realised just how much danger he was in at the time. Um, first of all, because up till now, when there have been terrorists on the street, it just means uh, that they've committed something, some act, or they're about to commit some act, and we assume that they'll be caught fairly quickly um, and dealt with. Um, I don't think I had a clue of what it meant uh, to have terrorists from Gaza on the streets of Sterot um, and how much danger my son was in. Um, and even now I'm kind of digesting the fact um, that he could very easily have been caught and killed or could now be in a tunnel in Gaza. And that's a, a kind of alarming and, and very disturbing thought. Um, and I think all of us, are still very much living with October the 7th. We're living with the repercussions of October the 7th. Um, I think probably the sentence for me, which, which constantly is in my mind, is the statements of Hamas that given the chance, they will repeat October the 7th again and again and again. Um, and I think that's very crucial in terms of understanding how Israelis are feeling. Um, that we're not just dealing with a one-off, we're dealing with a real attempt to destroy the Jewish state, and if Israel's army is not strong, then the murder and the rape and the burnings of people will repeat itself. Um, and for that reason, we're immensely grateful to the army that defends us. Um, and we're very aware that at the moment we're kind of in a constant dance with the devil, um, negotiating with these terrorists is, is, is a really uncomfortable thing um, and very unclear where Israel should be going and, and where it is going. And that's also kind of disturbing. Um, I think the word ceasefire, which always sounds very, very nice um, because all of us want an end to war and none of us want our kids going out into battle and all my friends' kids um, have been serving. Um, as well as my two sons, who both spent months and months and months um, in the army. Um, and ceasefire sounds good, but ceasefire leaving terrorists who can kill us um, is not so good. Um, and the other aspect of it, which which was kind of new to me and, and I'd never thought about before, um, came from, from a neighbour who has sons who are very high ranking in the army. Um, and they say to him that, that even pausing the fighting is difficult uh, for the soldiers who are involved in, in the battles um, because whenever you pause the fighting, that means that the soldiers have to retreat a little to a, to a place that's safe. Um, and that means that all of the soldiers who were killed to get as far as they got um, in, in the campaign, kind of, it feels like their lives were lost in vain because those battles are going to have to be refought. Um, so it, it, it's it's difficult because I'm not a militaristic person. I hate war. Um, I hate the concept of it. It seems so stupid um, and, and, and meaningless and ridiculous, and yet um, in many ways so very, very necessary. Um, and the flip side of feeling the need to fight the war and, and to fight it until there is victory is the pictures of the hostages everywhere. Um, and wherever you go in Jerusalem, you can't go more than a few metres without seeing pictures of hostages. Every bench um, on the streets has a photo of a hostage attached to it. Um, sometimes there are, there are 
a baby prams left on the street with a picture of a baby hostage on. They are absolutely everywhere um, and they're in our consciousness. And I think there's something very, very beautiful about being in a country which really cares about its people um, and does not forget them for a minute. And, and I admire that and I love that um, in the same way as I admire the fact that in Britain uh, the other day, the other night, people came out on the streets um, to oppose the racists and to stand up and defend those who are who are under threat. Um, there's something very beautiful about it all, um, but there's something also very exhausting about it all. Um, and the exhaustion is, is constant, um, in particular at the moment, because uh, we're waiting for the uh, for the Iranian um, response to Israel's killing of, of various terrorists. Um, everyone's in suspense. Um, no one knows when it's going to happen. No one knows how serious it's going to be. No one knows how devastating it's going to be. And friends have been going out, and I have too, and bought emergency lighting in case the electricity goes down, water in case they destroy our water supply, uh, long life milk in case there isn't food in the shops. Um, and we're just waiting, and it might all turn out to be nothing, which would be very, very lovely. Um, but in the meantime, um, every night, uh, I kind of wake up in the night, and if there's the sound of an airplane over the overhead, that's kind of a nerve-wracking experience. Um, and that's tough. It's not easy. Um, and living in Israel, I guess, has never been easy, um, but it's also very wonderful, um, and we feel very, very blessed to be here. Um, I don't know of anyone who wants to leave. Um, on the contrary, I think our, our sense of connection to the country um, gets stronger and stronger. Um, the, the feeling that you're participating in Jewish history and you're part of the Jewish people, um, and that's something very, very special. Um, I wanted to end with one um, kind of religious thought, um, because Tisha B'Av is approaching, um, and it's well known that the rabbis say that the, the, the Bet HaMikdash, the temple was destroyed because of Sinat Chinam, um, because of causeless hatred, um, people treating each other badly. Um, and I always wondered about that. And I have to confess, I was always a little cynical about it. It always seemed strange to me that, that, um, that arguments between people uh, could lead to such a dramatic event um, and to such an important historical event as the destruction of the Second Temple and eventually the expulsion of the Jewish people from our land. Um, I thought it seems a little bit exaggerated. Um, and I think the events of the last couple of years have really shown us that the rabbis were onto something very, very, very powerful um, because there seems to be no doubt um, that the splits that took place in Israel last year over the judicial reform um, and the fractious nature of the debate um, is what created uh, the space for our enemies who watched and saw um, to move in um, and to see that, that Israel was weak um, and to move in and attack us. And I remember very powerfully coming back one day on the train to the, to the main train station in Jerusalem um, and seeing two columns of Israelis marching in opposite directions, all of them holding Israeli flags, all of them convinced that what they were standing up for was right and true and important. Um, and yet that image of Israelis unable to, to talk to each other um, was very powerful and, and very disturbing um, and very much a kind of photo shot of what Sinat Chinam is. I should add that there were some who were doing wonderful work bringing people together um, and there were tents with circles for people on different sides to uh, sit down and talk together. Uh, there was a man standing in the middle of the road uh, with copies of the Chafetz Chaim's book about the laws of Lashon Hara, about the laws of gossip, which he would give to anyone who, who would give him a smile. So there were people who saw the need to treat each other well, um, but unfortunately yeah. we got ourselves very di divided, um, and that was and, and that was and that was very problematic. Um, and in terms of resolving it, um, well, first of all, I think it's really important to see that actually a miracle took place after October the 7th. And at least for a short time, Israelis learned very quickly that we could not 
indulge the luxury of causeless hatred. Um, and immediately following October the 7th, everyone came together. The people who'd refused to serve began serving. The people who'd been coordinating demonstrations took all of their equipment and put it to the to the purpose of, of recruiting people to come and to fight and to help and to serve. Um, and that was a miracle. It was an absolute miracle from total division to total unity. Sadly, now it seems like we're creeping back into the into the model of infighting, and that can't be good. And Rav Cook famously said that if the cause of the destruction of the temple was sinat chinam, if the cause of the destruction of the temple was that causeless hatred, then we had to reverse it. And we have to reverse it by having what he called ahavat chinam, which, by which he meant going out and just treating people well for no particular reason just going out and being kind and being caring. Um, but my Rosh Yeshiva, uh, Rav Amital, um, had a different take on it, um, and I think an even more powerful one. Uh, Rav Amital said, it's not Ahavat Chinam that we need. It's not causeless love. Actually, what we need to do is to realize and to appreciate that everybody is deserving of that love. Everyone is deserving of that kindness. Um, and when we realize that, then we won't just be giving ahavat chinam, but we'll be giving genuine ahava, and we'll be looking at people differently and treating people better. Um, and I think that's a wonderful message uh, with which to go into Tisha B'Av, the importance of just giving kindness and care and love to everybody in our communities. So I'm going to pause there. Um, and if anyone has any questions, I'd be really happy to chat about them. Um, and if they don't, it's Friday and we'll need to cook. Thank you so much, Gideon. I realised at the beginning I hadn't um, placed you, so I was going to say, just to remind people where you live, of course you do live in Jerusalem. And, uh, and in fact, last week's speaker was also from Jerusalem and, and um, in a very different way runs the train theatre and was talking about um, the, the uh, vacuees that he's working with in Jerusalem. And how in some ways Jerusalem feels the safest place to be and yet still everything is going around and that, as you say with Iran who knows what will, will happen um, but um, I assume that you're you're also aware of the evacuees you're probably doing work with them yeah. and, and and tell us maybe a little bit about that. Um, so certainly at the beginning of the war um, there were immense immense efforts um, to help the evacuees and, and people were baking for them um, and cooking for them. Um, I think that's some that's quietened down. I, I have friends who are evacuated uh, from their homes in the north of Israel. Um, and it's really, really, really difficult for them because um, while living in a hotel or living in a different place um, might seem quite exciting uh, for the first bit um, to have families crammed into hotel rooms uh, for a lengthy period of time uh, is really hard. Um, it means that friends also, just in terms of employment uh, for the coming year, um, it's very hard for them to know what they can do because they don't know where they're going to be living. They don't know which community they're going to be part of. Um, and all of that planning is is really, really, really hard. Um, and I think probably one of the, the forgotten things uh, when I spoke about how we have different images going on um, I think there doesn't seem to be that much reporting of um, the people from the north and the people. Oh, Gideon, you frozen. We were doing so well. I'm going to assume that Gideon will come back in a minute. Um, I was also going to say the that... People it, will be um, able to return oh, home You're soon. back, you're back. You, you, we, you, we lost you for a minute, you froze. Oh. But you're back, oh. so that's fine. Um, um. So I, I'm going to say and we've got... a about 10 minutes so if anybody wants to unmute themselves or put the yellow hand up and actually do this in person that would be lovely as well uh, so um do please do that you covered so much Gideon and it was just brilliantly put together that like going right back to the seventh and right up to date and and everything in between how how do you feel that it's affected your rabbinic work being being a rabbi in, and a leader in these times is always and then the extra stress level um how have you how um, have you found that 
so so I think for me one of the one of the most meaningful moments um was when I conducted a wedding a few weeks ago um in fact all the weddings I've done there have been people dressed in military uniform um turning up but at this one um they told me that I was going to be a witness um and then at the very last minute they said no no we've got someone else um and someone arrived um and he stank um he stank and he looked very disheveled um and the reason why he stank and looked very disheveled was because he'd come straight from Rafah. Um, he'd been fighting in Rafah a few hours ago. Um, I told him how amazing it was that he'd made this journey, um, presumably not an easy journey to make as well, because it's not an easy place to get out of, um, and not easy to make the journey across the country. Um, he said, no, no, don't thank me, thank my commander. Um, but I think I felt an enormous sense of humility um, just standing next to this man who moments before had been risking his life for us um, and would be going straight back from the wedding to um, to go and fight uh, on our behalf. And, and who knows, um, please God, he and his family will be safe. Um, but there are no guarantees about these things. Um, and that, that's very, very special and, and, and very makes one feel uh, very connected um, to everybody about and all my friends have have kids who as I said um, are serving in the army um, and that's also deeply humbling to hear their stories and hear what they're doing and to realize I think one of the things about living in Israel um, is that whereas to an extent I know even for for me when I lived in England uh, one would hear about terrible things going on in in Israel particularly during the second intifada um, but it was really kind of, you heard numbers of people who'd been killed. Um, whereas here, there's an element of you're checking the newspapers each day just to be sure that it's not one of your friends or one of your friend's kids um, who's been killed. Everyone is very, very, very close. Um, and the action is very, very, very close. Um, and I think that's part of the, the joy of living in Israel because you really feel part of something much bigger than yourself. Um, it's an immense privilege. Um, and on the other hand, it comes with with tension. Yes, I, I think what you said at the beginning about how you dealt with your son being in Sidora, which I hadn't actually known. I think that's also part of it, isn't it? That you you find a way of, of being normal or carrying on normal day to day. Uh, and then you're brought up short against it and then you have to continue again. So people always refer to Tel Aviv and how, and it's probably the same in Jerusalem, that all the cafes are full because people want to make the most of the time when they can. They want to be with friends. They want to be living a, a quote unquote normal life. Um, and so going on to the beach and going to the cafes and, and presumably we don't talk about it, but I presume people are, are having people around to the houses as well. And Friday night dinner still got a, a table for them. that kind of thing that keeps you in in able to continue and not just be sit there being very depressed and not not living, as it were. Is that correct? Right. Yes, absolutely. Life does go on. Even on October the 7th itself, um, I had guests for lunch um, and the husband came round and he was said his family were very nervous, but we agreed that they would come. Uh, this Shabbat, I have guests. Um, and and we do try and carry on with life, but there is this kind of buzz in the background. Um, and sometimes um, I guide for the March of the Living and various groups in Poland. Um, so at a certain point, even just reading about the Holocaust was in some ways a break from the tension of reading about what's going on around you. Um, and in terms of your question about, about how rabbinic life kind of changes in the light of what's going on, I think Poland was a kind of supreme example of that, because I think normally when I take, um, and I've been leading the student bus, uh, when I take students into Poland, normally the events of anti-Semitism feel quite distant for them, um, and it takes them a leap of kind of imagination to, to kind of work out what it's all about and, and get their heads around it. Um, and suddenly on this trip, things were very, very different. Um, and everybody understood uh, exactly what it was about. Um, and there was a whole different level of consciousness um, on the bus uh, when speaking about anti-Semitism um, and speaking about where it can go and where hatred can go.
um, a whole new level of understanding. Um, and I also saw that when I did a trip across the campuses in at the, at the beginning of the war, I came uh, with with one of the survivors of, of one of the kibbutzim in the south of Israel, um, and we did a tour of campuses. Um, and again, it was it was just alarming to hear how people were very aware of anti-Semitism um, in ways that we never were during my youth. Um, and just to hear that students on, I remember a year ago on the March of the Living, being absolutely amazed to discover that Jewish students in England, uh, that none of the students' societies publicize where their activities are taking place. Um, it's all kept very secret and hush-hush among the Jewish students. Um, and that was a year ago, um, which again was never the case in my time. So a little alarming to discover that, that, that they experience anti-Semitism firsthand um, and as a result of what's going on here. Yes, I, th I think that's, um, we, you know, we, we, we keep saying that we've never been through anything like this. Uh, and I, I had to remind myself that we haven't been through anything like this, but we have been through plenty, you know, 2019 and the Intifadas and just spurts of it. It never goes away. But I think because there hadn't been something like what actually happened on the day of the 7th, and it, it was such a wake-up call. And I think it did make people rethink values and, um, and as you said, with the judicial reform protests as well, you know, that they, in, in a way, they were wonderful because they had a ready-made group of people to help move the, the equipment that was needed by the army to, to do the cooking that was needed to just spur people on. I mean, it's been an amazing period and 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 very frightening and yet very inspiring. Um, and I think what you're doing is totally inspiring and I um, hats off to you. And thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you. And... I, guess, I guess one final thought would be that yes. um, my teacher, Rabbi Riskin, used to say to us in Psalm 23, the Lord's my shepherd, I shall not want. Um, it talks about the idea, King David talks about the idea that, that you're, staff and your rod comfort me um so the staff is clearly something that one leans on and and one feels a certain comfort from god um in the fact that that we have shivtacha we have uh mishantacha we have the thing to lean on um but the rod is more complicated because a, a rod is normally something that that's used to to whack people um and to bash people and he suggested um and it's not an idea that i'm comfortable with but i it kind of really feels true is that sometimes in Jewish history, just the repeat of anti-Semitism and hatred of Jews um, in any number of different contexts, it's just a reminder that there is something special about the Jewish people um, and that we are trying to achieve something beautiful and special. Um, and there's an idea that the that the Messiah is born on Tisha B'Av. Um, so even from the, the deepest mourning and the most difficult times, uh, the rabbis always saw hope and always saw that we have a mission and that we can make the world a better place um, and we can do it with Ahavat Khina. Amen. Thank you so much. I wish you, you and everyone on the call a uh, safe um, weekend, a Shabbat Shalom, full of pos probable, possible, definite Shalom and a good fast. And thank you for joining us again. Thank you all for coming thank you. And joining us too. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.